Hello and welcome to the latest episode of MPP Insider, your source for all the latest news in the marijuana policy reform movement. I'm Mike Mino, and this week I'm joined by another one of our all-star legislative analysts, Bob Kopecki. Bob, how you doing? I'm doing well, Mike. Thank you for having me. I thanks appreciate for, it. Thanks for being on The Insider. Anytime. So the big news this week is uh, yesterday, uh, representatives from the Arizona Medical Marijuana Policy Project submitted more than 250,000 signatures to the Arizona Secretary of State's office, hoping to qualify medical marijuana for the ballot in Arizona this November. Uh, they only need a little more than 150,000 signatures to qualify, so we're real confident this is going to be something Arizona voters will be able to vote on come November. Uh, there was a press conference yesterday in Phoenix. Our campaign manager out there, Andrew Myers, campaign manager for the AMMPP uh, did a great job. We got a lot of p positive feedback from the community. Uh, polling has been real encouraging. And uh, Bob, this means that Arizona is going to join South Dakota this November in having medical marijuana on the ballot. It certainly does. South Dakota is going to have a ballot initiative as well. Uh, in 2006, South Dakota had a ballot initiative that was narrowly defeated. So we're real hopeful that with the, the more time we've had for education and for you know outreach, that we'll, we'll pass a medical marijuana initiative in South Dakota this year as well. Yeah, and I, I guess now would be a good time to point out that, you know, there are still about a dozen states, maybe more across the country that in the state legislatures have been considering medical marijuana this year. It's very true. We've been working heavily in Illinois, in New York, in Maryland, in, in Delaware. Delaware. And, you know, we've even seen conservative states like Kansas, Alabama, Tennessee, Tennessee. introduce bills. So. Alabama and Tennessee actually moved bills out of committee. It was real, it was real encouraging and real it was fun. It was a good time to see. You know, yeah. Dan Riffle, Noah Mamber, Eric McDaniel, we've all, all been doing a fantastic job. Yeah. Go state policies. Um, and one of the reasons we have Bob here today is to talk about uh, the state of Rhode Island, where they've had a healthy medical marijuana program for a few years now, but now they're considering bills uh, to improve their marijuana laws even more. Tell us about them, Bob. They are. Last night, the House Judiciary Committee in Rhode Island met to hear a couple bills. Uh, the first bill they took up was a decriminalization legislation. Uh, decriminalization would remove the criminal penalties associated with possession of up to an ounce of marijuana and replace them with a simple civil violation. Um, they heard this bill, there was great testimony in favor of the bill and little testimony in opposition. Uh, the next bill they heard was a tax and regulate bill which would remove the criminal penalties associated with you know possession and mm -hmm. use and transportation and replace replace the current marijuana prohibition in Rhode Island with, with a tax and regulated structure that would be set up by the state. Similar to the way we tax and regulate alcohol. Very similar to the way we tax, tax and regulate alcohol. There would be provisions in there for adults who are 21 and older to have three plants. They could grow three plants so long as they grow them in a locked and enclosed facilities and have licensing from the state. And there would be a three-tier distribution uh, mechanism or, mm -hmm. or setup that would have wholesalers to retailers to consumers. So it's very similar with alcohol. One of the reasons I think it's really exciting that Rhode Island is now talking about this is so much of the debate over marijuana issues, especially when the media is talking about it, centers on states on the West Coast, out West. You know, we're talking about California's ballot initiative this year. But I mean, you know, tiny little Rhode Island over there on, on the East Coast in New England uh, do, doing their part as well. So it's, it's just exciting to see it all across the country. It's true. And there are ballot initiatives in Oregon as well. Washington had a tax and regulate bill that was defeated in committee, unfortunately. But the conversation has started. And once this conversation gets going, it's, it's pretty clear that it'll be a positive and educational one. Another place where we have a tax and regulate initiative uh, in the works is in Nevada for 2012. Uh, where recently Sarah Palin gave an interesting speech. Uh, the, the, the media's favorite Sarah Palin, former Alaska governor, gave a speech at the National Convention of the Wine and Spirits Wholesaler, essentially to an alcohol interest group. And uh, w uh, an MPP-backed campaign out there, Nevadans for Sensible Marijuana Laws, made uh, former Governor Palin a very interesting offer. They said they would pay her $25,000 if she made a similar speech to supporters of a regulated marijuana market. Uh, she never actually formally accepted or declined the offer, but uh, we were able to, uh, you know, push the conversation about the relative harms of alcohol and marijuana because of this. And it culminated in an appearance on none other than Fox News' The O'Reilly Factor by MPP's director of state campaign, Steve Fox. Steve Fox was great in that yeah. interview. He was able to make the argument that yeah. marijuana is indeed safer than mm -hmm. alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's. 
the science is there. It's just it's just another choice for adults to reasonably use. We're not right. no one's advocating for you know people to go out there and smoke marijuana and drive. It's in the privacy of your own home. It's just an alternative choice. And just that it choice. makes no sense to punish adults who make this, the reasonable choice to use the safer of the two substances. Absolutely no sense. So so that was a great uh, appearance for those of you who haven't seen it. It's online. Uh, you can see links to it on uh, MPP TV. Go check it out, Steve Fox on The O'Reilly Factor. Another big uh, highlight we got uh, from one of MPP's own was yesterday Aaron Houston, our Director of Government Relations, testified before a congressional subcommittee. It was a House Appropriations Subcommittee. And uh, he had a really interesting point. Uh, Bob, do you want to go into it or should I? I'll let you explain it. Okay, so. What Aaron basically uh, asked the committee was to encourage the Department of Justice uh, to ensure that in states that are furloughing prisoners, meaning uh, because of budget difficulties, they're letting prisoners out early uh, for whatever reason, to make sure that marijuana offenders, people who are in jail for no other reason than nonviolent crimes involving marijuana, uh, that those people are released before people who have been convicted of violent crimes, uh, you, you know, and this includes uh, crimes of, uh, well, you assault. Know, assault, you know. Assault, deadly weapon, yeah, and, sexual assault. And, and we've obviously seen, uh, well, it might not be obvious to some, but there was an Associated Press article recently that was talking about how more than a dozen states across the country are actually taking up these programs where they're releasing prisoners early, and a lot of times the people who are being released have really violent histories. Um, so it would only make sense to let out nonviolent marijuana offenders before these people who are obviously no threat to society. Absolutely. I mean, neither of us are congr congressmen, Mike, but it seems like a no-brainer to me that if you're going to have to release someone for furlough reasons, you're going to choose the, the least violent of those who are currently serving time mm -hmm. to release. So uh, people in, in prison and in incarceration for marijuana offense only, it's a nonviolent crime. It, it doesn't make sense to get violent offenders on the street when there are plenty of non-violent offenders, unfortunately, who are still locked up. Right. And if uh, you want to find out more about Aaron's testimony, there's going to be an accompanying video with uh, Aaron Houston, our Director of Government Relations, also on uh, MPP's YouTube channel, so check that out as well. Um, now, just to wrap things up here legislatively, let you guys know where we are. We have been talking a lot about medical marijuana in Maryland, where MPP has been lobbying for a medical marijuana law. Um, Last week, Maryland Senate voted by a really healthy margin, 35 to 12, to pass medical marijuana in Maryland. Unfortunately, the House did not get to vote on it before the close of Maryland's uh, legislative session, which was this Monday. Uh, so this means that patients in Maryland are going to have to wait at least another year before they see an effective medical marijuana law. It's frustrating. It's true. But it's, it's unfortunate, but we'll be back next year working on the same bill. Dan Riffle, Karen O'Keefe are doing a great job. Mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're, they're fighting for patients' rights and the right for physicians to recommend medical marijuana for seriously ill individuals in Maryland. And the latest is that there's going to be a work group uh, with the, the House working throughout this summer uh, on that law. So you know, sometimes these things take more than one year. Hopefully, we'll be back there next year and uh, we can get a medical marijuana law for Maryland. Uh, Bob, any other updates in your states? There's something happened in Washington that was sort it's of It's true. Washington passed a, they revised their medical marijuana program this past year. And big thanks goes to the ACLU in Washington and Allison Holcomb in particular for, for pushing this, this bill through. Uh, what this bill does is it opens up the list of medical providers who can recommend medical marijuana. So it now includes nurse practitioners and other various uh, non-physician medical providers. Uh, this bill is really important, especially at a time you see this news coming out recently where there's doctor shortages, and so more people are getting their health care from people like nurse practitioners. They've already got the, the power give, granted to them by the state to prescribe you know, controlled substances mm -hmm. and any, any medication that doctors can prescribe. So, so we're just asking that that be extended to marijuana. Exactly. Well, medical marijuana. So long as they can prescribe these controlled substances, why can they not recommend medical marijuana to their patients who need it? And Washington saw the light, and they, they voted that, yes, they can. And thank you again to Allison Holcomb and the ACLU. All right, great. Well, I think that's going to do it for us here uh, for the MPP Insider. I'm Mike Mino. I'm Bob Capecchi. Joined this week by the one and only Bob Capecchi. Uh, for more updates, please check out our site, mpp.org, and our blog at blog.mpp.org. And we'll catch you next time.